Good morning, brothers and sisters. Again, we want to thank you all for tuning in as we continue to uh, combat this uh, epidemic. Uh, at this time, I ask that you all pray with me as I pray out loud. Heavenly Father, we approach your throne this mercy. Father, we bow heads and humble hearts, Father. Just thank you for waking us up and see another day that wasn't promised. Father, we just ask, Father, that you forgive us for our sins that we've committed in this body, whether it's done by word, thought, or deed, both knowingly and unknowingly, Father. And Father, we just pray, Father, that as this world cry out, Father, we just pray, Father, that uh, you place your hands of healing upon this earth and heal it, Father. We ask that you be with the physicians, Father, and those who are sick and afflicted, Father. We just ask, Father, that you must turn them to a portion of part of their health. Father, we ask that you be with the leaders of the land as well, that when they make the decisions, uh, they are just decisions. And Father, we ask that you clear our minds and our hearts at this time, that we focus on nothing else, Father, to worship you in spirit and in truth. We ask that you be with the speaker, Father. May you give him a ready recollection of the things that he studied. May he deliver a message with no addition, no subtraction, and it can be understood from the youngest to the oldest. We thank you for your love, your mercy. And most of all, we thank you for your son. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. For our first selection, the title of our song will be, I Should Not Be Moved. Glory, hallelujah, I shall not be moved. I'm anchored in Jehovah, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. I shall I shall not be moved. I shall not. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved in this love of I shall not be moved, and in him combined, oh, I shall not be moved, just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved, we're singing, I shall not, I shall not be moved, I, I shall not, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water, I shall not be moved. Though all hell assail me, I shall not be moved. You know my Jesus will not fail me. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. We're singing, I shall not, I shall not be moved. We're singing, I, I shall not, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. No, the tempest rages. I shall not be moved. I'm on the rock 
of ages. I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. I shall not be moved. We'll sing it. I we shall not, I shall not be moved. We'll sing it. I, I shall not, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree that's planted by the water. Oh Lord, yes, I shall not. Be moved, shall not be moved. We'll sing it. I, oh, I, I shall not be moved. We'll sing it. I, I shall not, I shall not be moved just like a tree that's planted by the water. Oh Lord, yes, I shall not be moved. Amen. Amen. Pass me not, O oh gentle say, Savior, and hear my humble. Cry while oh, others down are called, calling to not pass me by. I'm calling on my Savior, oh Lord, my Savior. My humble cry, while oh, others doubt our call, calling, O oh Lord, do not pass me by. I'm calling on my Savior. Yeah, oh Lord, my Savior, Savior, hear my humble cry, while on earth doubt I call, and call it, oh Lord, oh Lord. Amen. Good morning again, brothers and sisters. This morning, scripture reading is taken from the book of St. John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. This the book of St. John, chapter 3. Verses 16 and 17. And it reads, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into this world to condemn the world, but that the world through him may be saved. I just read from you the book of St. John, chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. May the Lord add a blessing to the readers, hearers, and the doers of his word. Give me that old time. 
gospel, give me that old time gospel, give me that old time gospel. It's good enough for me, it will take you on home to glory, it will take you all home to glory, it will take you on home to glory, it's good enough for me, it was good for all and inside it was good for Paul and Sina. It was good for Paul and Sina. It's good enough for me. So give me that old time gospel. Give me that old time gospel. Give me that old time gospel. It's Good enough for me. Give me that old time gospel. It was good enough for Paul and Silas. It was good enough for Peter and James, and certainly it is good enough for all of us in this day and time. We're so thankful unto God for the gospel, for this is the method that God uses to reach the lost souls of today. We're so thankful to God for that great gospel message of his son Jesus the Christ who came, bled, and died that through the world, that the world through him might be saved. We're so thankful that God has once again afforded us the opportunity to Assemble, even though we are, as the body of Christ, can't be together, we are still together in the gospel of Christ. We are, we are still together in the word of God. We are still together as the body of Christ. And it's good that God has made it so. Amen. We're so thankful that you have uh, joined us in our worship service today via the internet or the phone conference or whatever, whatever method that you have uh, joined us in. We're so thankful to have you with us. We are living in a climate today where Jesus is what we really need. We have heard it's said that maybe God is trying to uh, show us something, and perhaps maybe he is. But one thing about it, Jesus is all we need, and is all we will ever need. You know, it's, I'm still trying to get used to the idea of, you know, it's only a couple of us here, two or three of us here, but we're trying to do our best to still serve God. But as for a minister, I, I seen a brother last week saying, well, he didn't care. You know, he was still going to preach the word. And it's just like you look out in the audience and he can see a full congregation. Well, that's his take. I look out in the audience and I don't see <laughs> really anybody. So, but it's all good. The word of God is still going to be preached just that. You know, sometimes you, the audience, you look at the audience faces, you, you, you can see that they're giving you feedback and, and, and you are seeing that if they're hearing the message or, or not. And, and all that makes a difference when you're up here proclaiming the word of God. But one thing is for sure. One thing is for sure. As long as the minister, 
the messenger of God. Because in the spirit, that's all that is required. God will do the rest. Amen. Amen. So glad to have you with us this morning. As was read in our scripture reading by Brother Stan, and we thank him and Brother Reed for helping us to live stream our worship today. John 3.16, very familiar passage of scripture. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That the world through Christ Jesus, what? Might be saved. Not that they will be saved, but that they might be saved. You know, there is a story uh, that goes something like this. You know, I'm not very good at uh, relaying stories and stuff, but every once in a while, I'll try my best to, to share one if it relates to what we're going to be talking about today. There was a, there was a preacher who had two sons. One son was faithful. He was faithful in the church. He was a faithful song leader in his congregation. And the other was a, he was a military officer. However, he was a unbeliever in Christ. Well, during a Thanksgiving family holiday gathering, the three of them decided to go on a fishing trip real quick as the dinner were, was being prepared for Thanksgiving. And while fishing, the boat began to tilt because, you know, as anyone who has been in one of those small boats can tell you, if the weight is not even, then you're going to go over. Raise your hand on that, Brother Dems. Amen. Because it didn't happen to me. Amen. <laughs> but the, the boat began to tilt. And because there was too much weight on one side of the boat. And, and before they could make the adjustment, the boat capsized. Mm -hmm. Now, the father was the only one of the three that could swim. So as his two sons struggled to stay alive, the father had to make a quick choice. He had to make a choice as to what, which one would he decide to save first? So instinctively, he went to the unsaved son who had already gone under the water two times. Mustering all of his energy he, he could muster, he dived under and saved the unsaved son. son and then he goes to, to try to, to save the believing son. However, after finally reaching the other son, though he tried his very, very best, mm -hmm. though he put all of his effort and energy in trying to save his son, mm -hmm. he had not enough strength to save his son. And he had enough, not enough strength to save himself. Mm -hmm. So, Two sacrifices were made that awful day that one life could be saved. Now, the person that was telling this story was a preacher. He was a, a minister of a very, very large congregation. Yeah. Amen. A church, by the way, that he had started from 10 members had now grown over, over, over 2,000 congregants. So the preacher telling the story to his congregation was the unbelieving son that was saved that day. Amen. And because he was saved that day, because he was saved on that Thanksgiving day, over thousands of other souls were saved. 
You know, church, family, and friends. When we think of the cross of Calvary, what we often picture in our mind's eye is a picture of the Son of God, Jesus, our Savior, enduring the most horrific death known to mankind. And if we, particularly those Christians who, who knows and believes the story, if we meditate on that awful day, it will bring tears and, and remorse even to our most inner core even to our hearts and our souls. Amen. You know, the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah 53, and, and the verse number is five, there he says, but he was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes are we healed. Yes, yes, yes. The, the, the Lamb of God was sacrificed that day. But yet he lives. And he lives forevermore. But I want us to notice something this morning. Another sacrifice was made that day. That through Christ Jesus countless, countless many souls could have the opportunity to live forevermore with peace with God. Amen. So today, this morning, we will expound on the two sacrifices that were made on Mount Calvary that day. There were two. Our topic is one cross, two sacrifices. One cross, two sacrifices. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have what? Everlasting life. Amen. John said, in your Bible and mine, God loved the world so much that it moved him. It moved him to give the most precious thing that he had, his only begotten son. Wow. Can you imagine the magnitude of what God gave. Keep that in mind as we go forth. It is only logical then to assume that from Jesus' very birth, God from heaven watched his sons every move. He watched from heaven upon every move that Jesus made while he was on his earth. Now notice what I said. I said, he watched his every move. He watched his every move, but he didn't orchestrate his every step. And we have to understand that. He watches from heaven, but he does not orchestrate our steps as he did his son. Amen. The Bible says of Jesus in Hebrews 5 and in verse number 8, Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Like you and I, Jesus had to learn some things. He had to go through some things. He had to suffer some things to learn something about the God of heaven. Amen. Again, in Hebrews 4, in verse number 15, it says that Jesus was in all points, not some, but was in all points tempted like as we are yet without sin. Amen. So yes, yes, God watched from heaven, 
But Jesus had to make choices in his life, just like we all do. Amen. So what are some of the things then that God observed when he watched his son from heaven? Well, one of the things that he observed happened in Matthew 3 in verse number is 16 through 17. There the Bible says, and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lightning upon him. And in verse number 17 it says, and lo, a voice from heaven, saying, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. <laughs> you know, church, the Bible says that God is well pleased with his son on this occasion. Amen. Amen. But we need to be careful, though, here. We need to be careful and note Jesus did not get baptized because of sin. He said he got baptized to what? To fulfill all righteousness. Amen. This occasion was obviously divinely appointed. Why? Because Jesus' actions, the Bible says, please his heavenly father. Jesus' actions please the God of heaven. Amen. So God is pleased with his son. Can I share something with you this morning? Well, God is pleased when we work the work of righteousness in our lives as well. God is pleased then. God is pleased, church. God is pleased, family and friends, when we do what is right, when we do the right thing. Amen. When we repent of our sins and get baptized in the name of Jesus the Christ, God is pleased. And because God is pleased with our actions, watch this. He gives us a very, very precious gift. Amen. When our actions please God, amen, he's going to bless us. In this case, he's blessed us with the gift of the Holy Spirit when we are baptized in the name of Christ Jesus, Acts 2 and verse number 38. Question, have you pleased God? Have you pleased God in your life this way? Well, perhaps there could be no better climate to consider pleasing God and giving your life to God even today. We're up to over 20,000 people are dead in, a, in America today, over 20,000. And we're talking about in a, in a span of a matter of a couple of weeks. I have to wonder how many, how many have given their life to Christ? I wonder if they had an inkling that day we're going to get that disease and, and die within two or three days. I wonder if they would have considered pleasing God and, and giving them, them their lives. Just a thought. Maybe it's a thought that maybe perhaps some of you might even entertain even today. We don't know. But tomorrow is not promised to any of us. Amen. So God watching from heaven at Jesus being baptized was pleased, the Bible says. But, but what else did God see from heaven? Well, God saw other things from heaven. There were times when God watched his son from heaven and had to use great restraint. This certainly was true in the Garden of Gethsemane. If you have your Bibles, turn with us over there to Luke, the 22nd chapter, Luke 22. And we'll start our reading at about around 39. 
In this particular text we see that Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. And he understands, he knows that his time was at hand. He understood that the agony of the cross was at hand. Amen. And like any other human being, church, Jesus is having some anxiety about what that day would surely bring. Amen. Yes, he was the son of God, but he was just as much human as you and I. And I'm suggesting to all of us today that Jesus is having an issue with what was coming down the pipe for him in a matter of hours. Amen. So he goes to his father in prayer. And I, I believe that, that the, the spirit had just put in the word because he wants to leave an example, an example for us to follow when life troubles comes our way. That's why he says, pray without ceasing. That's why Jesus says, watch and pray. That's what we need to be doing today. Look at Luke 22, start with verse number 39. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. Jesus only bows in, in God's presence. And he says, Lord, he says, Father God, if you so will it to be, watch this now, if you so will it to be, this thing do not have to happen that way. But he goes further to say, but I know it's not what I want in this matter. Do we need to catch this? I know that it's not what I want. I know that it's all about what you want. And I also know that that is all that matters. Oh, to have the mind of Christ. I wonder if our minds are such as Jesus Christ. And look at verse number 43, he says, and he, and there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. So God, seeing his son from heaven, he responds to his prayer request. He responds by sending an angel to strengthen his son. Amen. Check that now. But then the Bible says, 44, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was that it were great drops of drops of blood falling down on the ground. Jesus is it's messed up on the inside. He has turmoil going on in his inner man, in his soul. And God watches from heaven. He watches his son being tormented, being in agony, beseeching him to find another way. God is seeing him pleading, crying out, Lord, is it another way? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the internal turmoil that Jesus is going through right now? Can you even imagine it? Can you imagine what God seeing, looking from heaven? Can you imagine what God is feeling right now as he watches his son being that way? Can you imagine? Can you imagine the hurt and the pain? Can you imagine the pressure of restraint that is shown by God the Father? Yes, he sent an angel. An angel tried to help. But Jesus needed something else. Amen. The angel was good, but he went back and prayed again. And his father, he's looking at this. He watched. He watched his son. And he watched. And he watched, 
being restrained to do something more for him. Until finally, finally, he heard these words from his son. Oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. Matthew 26 and verse number 42. Though it pained him, church, though it pained him, family and friend, though it grieved him to watch his son being in agony, he waited. God waited. And he waited until finally his son aligned his will to the will of that of the Father. I wonder how long will God have to wait for us to align our wills to his will. I wonder how long God will have to wait. Listen to me. Both father and son suffered pain and agony that the world could be, might be saved. But not only did God watch his son get baptized, not only did he watch his only begotten son go through the agony and the pain in the garden of Gethsemane, but he watched him, he watched him get beaten and spit on and treated worse than any animal, even by his own people. Amen. Amen. But worse than even all of that, God watched from heaven. He watched his only begotten son hang on the cross of Calvary for hours. Wow. You still have your Bibles with you this morning? I hope you do. Turn with us over there to Mark, the 15th chapter. Mark 15. And we're going to notice something here this morning that I hope we all come to the understanding and all come to the grip in our own heart what takes place on this mighty, awful, terrible, but yet grateful day. For the ultimate, the ultimate sacrifice is of that day. Look at verse number. Uh, Let's just start with verse number 21. Verse number 21. And they compared one Simon of a Cyrenian who passed by, coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him unto the place of Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of a skull. And they gave him drink, and they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon him, and every man should take. And in verse number 25, it says, and it was what? And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. Jesus' crucifixion started at nine o'clock in the morning. The third hour. Now I want us to skip down to verse number 33. Likewise, also, well, let's just start with that, that 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land 
until the ninth hour. From nine o'clock to 12 o'clock noon, three hours later, while Jesus is still hanging there on the cross, on the cross, the Bible says that the whole world goes dark. For three hours, he's hung there now, bleeding, dying. And the whole world, the Bible says, goes dark. Those Jews who always found a way to, to mock him, who always tried to find a way to ridicule him, who always tried to find a way to debunk him, those Jews who asked for a sign from heaven, remember that, to prove that he was the son of God, Matthew 16 and verse number one. Well, well, they finally got a sign. They finally got their sign. The Jews finally got their signs by the omnipotent power of God of heaven. For only he can bring darkness over the entire world in the middle of the day. Only God can do such a great thing as that. Yet, yet though, notice this. It has been three hours. And that awesome, mighty, powerful God of heaven, the creator of all things, the ruler of all things. Three hours. And he has looked upon his blooded, dying son and suffered it to be. And suffered it to be so. Wow. Only God. Look at verse number 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? For six long, gruesome hours, Jesus hung there. For six long, gruesome hours, Jesus hung there, beaten, blooded, and broken. For six long hours, God watched from heaven, pained, grieved, and hurting. Six long hours, he restrained himself from coming to his rescue. For six long hours, being in agony, Jesus sacrificed his will to wait on God. For six long hours in unimaginable grief, God watched. He watched from heaven, being pain, being grieved, hurting, can't even describe the, the emotions that God must have been feeling all this time to see him, his only begotten son, being treated that way. How could he do it? For six long hours. Yet, he restrained himself. He didn't come to his only begotten son's rescue. How could he do it? What a sacrifice. One gruesome cross. Two great 
sacrifices. One gruesome cross, but two mighty great sacrifices. Why? 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 That you and me and the whole world can choose to make a choice to be saved. Amen. Jesus said, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross daily, and follow me. Luke 9, and the verse number is 23. You see, friends, you see, church, you see those who are watching for the first time. To deny self is to sacrifice the things of the flesh that we can be pleasing in God's sight. John said, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but of the world. Are we going to make a choice today? Like Jesus, we must align our wills to God's will and make the sacrifice. That is if we want to be saved. That is if we're going to be saved. We're going to have to make the sacrifice and wait on God. God will do the rest. If you notice that, he did it for Jesus. But Jesus had to make the check. He had to make the sacrifice. God had to make the sacrifice. And they both did for your sake and mine. Are you willing today? Are you willing to make the sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life for your soul's salvation? After all, it is your soul's salvation. Either you will make the sacrifice to be saved or you will not make the sacrifice and not be saved. Listen, let me wrap this up, but before I do, I want to make this thing plain and simple for all of us today. We see the great sacrifice that God has made, that Jesus had made, that the Spirit of God had made. We see the sacrifice. When we stand before Jesus in that judgment day, and we will, and we find and we be found lacking, and Jesus says, Depart from me, ye worker of iniquity, I never knew you. Now I want to ask a question. If our souls are condemned, whose fault will it be? No, 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 no. I don't want no shadow thought. I don't want no shadow thinking. I want you to meditate on this question. Whose fault will it be? Christ sacrificed. God sacrificed his life, his son's life, that we can make a choice. And it all boils down to the choice about Jesus, the Christ. Do you know him? Do he know you? When you stand before him in that judgment day and you be found lacking, whose fault will it really be? Will it be Jesus' fault? Will it be God the Father's fault? Will it be even the Holy Spirit's fault because he's the one who's convicting you right now in your heart. That's the work of the Holy Spirit of God. And you can either say, yes, I hear you, or no, I don't hear you, I won't hear you, I refuse to hear you. That's your choice. 
But let me tell you something that you will remember for the rest of your life. When you stand before Jesus in that end day, you can't say, I didn't know anymore. Ignorance is not going to be an excuse because you know now. When we found, if we are found lacking, whose fault will it be? It will be our own fault. Amen. So if you're here, if you're listening today, and you haven't given your life to Christ, now is a good time to consider doing that. You heard how Jesus came from heaven, how he died for your sin. The question is, do you believe it? Do you believe it enough to take some action? Like Jesus, he, he took action and got baptized because he was appointed, not that he had sinned. But do you believe enough to, to give your life to Christ and, and go, through the, go through what he asked us to do in baptism? Repent of your ways. That is, are you willing to make a sacrifice finally to overcome the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life that you've been struggling with? all these years. Repent of your ways. Be willing to, to go down in the water and grave of baptism and you will be given the Holy Spirit of God. You become a new creature, the Bible says. But can I stop just for one moment? You know, God is not asking us to be perfect. He's asking us to work our way towards perfection. Work out your own salvation in fear and trembling, he says. Yes, we're going to all mess up. We all mess up. We all make mistakes. We sin. But the difference in a child of God and a, 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 a person that is not a child of God is a child of God can go to him and repent and ask for forgiveness. And the Bible says he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Amen. That's the difference. Then we get up and go on and, rock, and walk right in the spirit. Wherein a child of a person who don't know God does not have that. Have that. Have, have, does not have that. Can't do that. So will you give your life to Christ today? We thank you for joining in on us, with us on our worship service today. As we go through another week, we pray that God will protect us, guide us, and keep us in his care. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father God, for your great sacrifice, your son's great sacrifice that day. Oh, Lord, help us to really, really internalize the greatness of that day. Help us to internalize, Father God, the great love that was shown that day. By you, you yourself, and also by your Holy Spirit and your Son. Oh, we thank you, Father. Please forgive us. Forgive us, Lord God, of any sin that we have committed against thee. Please hold those things not against us in that end day. We pray, dear God, that this message would permeate the hearts of all who have heard it, that we would all make a decision to give our lives and live our lives according to your word. We thank you. We thank you for your son. We thank you for your spirit. We thank you for all that you have done and will do for us. Please be our refuge and our strength this week. Please be our buckler and our shield, delivering us from all evil and all temptation. We thank you in advance for doing that for us, dear God, knowing and looking by faith as we put our trust, our dependence, and our faith in thee. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let us all say amen. 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 We thank Brother Dennis for that powerful message he has brought before us this morning. And as we prepare ourselves for the Lord's Supper, we'll sing two standards of the old rugged cross. On a hill far away stood an old Rugged cross, the 
lumbar suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of love sinner was slain. So I cherish the over again for such a powerful message that is right on time in dealing with the perilous times of today. This part of the service is the Lord's Supper. In Matthew chapter 26 verses 26 through 28, Jesus Christ himself instituted the Lord's Supper. In Acts chapter 20 verse 7, Paul and apostles came together every first, of, first day of the week to break bread and give thanks. And we are instructed on how to partake of the Lord's Supper in 1 Corinthians, the 11th chapter, verses 23 through 30, in which the same night Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner, when he took the cup, he sucked, saying, this cup is the New Testament of my blood. This you do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For often as you eat of this bread and drink of this cup of the Lord, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat of this bread and drink of this cup, unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discern the Lord's body. And for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. At this time, I will bless the bread as well as the cup, shall we pray? Father God, we ask you to bless this bread, which is the body of your darling son that was broken and shed for us. We ask, Father, that you also bless this cup, which is the blood of your darling son that was shed for our sins. We pray, Father, that as we partake of it, you partake in a manner that is pleasing and acceptable in your sight. We thank you and we love you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.
This concludes the Lord's Supper. And this part of service is given in Acts chapter 20, verse 35. Christ himself said, Blessed is more to give than it is to receive. And we are instructed on how to give in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. He that soweth sparingly shall reap sparingly, but he that soweth bountifully shall reap bountifully. So let every man give at his purpose in his heart, not of grudgingly or necessity, and let him remember the Lord loves your forgiver. At this time, we will ask that uh, if you would like to mail in your offering, please do so and mail it in to uh, Ch Church of Christ located at 232 North 32nd Street, San Diego, California, 92120. That is 232 North 32nd Street, San Diego, California, 92120. Thank you. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the noon, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus when the sun goes down, my, my, you got to love him, love him, love him in the morning. Love him in the noontime. Love him, love him, love him when the sun goes down. My, mind, you got to praise him, praise him, praise him in the morning, praise him in the noontime. Praise him, praise him, praise him when the sun goes down. My, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus in the morning, Jesus in the new time, Jesus, oh my Jesus, Jesus when the sun goes 